higher education was opening up in the 60s. It wasn't just a social elite, but you're getting the children of working class people, very high expectations. Nineteen sixty-eight was the year of the student. There were seven million enrolled in American colleges, and the mood on campus was unmistakably rebellious. People cutting class to go off on demonstrations or to march on Washington and so forth, and a general lack of civility and a general disrespect for uh, uh, intellectual activity, uh, which was regarded as, as they used to say, not relevant. In the spring of nineteen sixty-eight. Columbia University in New York became the flashpoint of student revolt. There were two demands. End Columbia's affiliation with IDA, a military think tank, and stop construction of a university gym that would replace a park in Harlem. On April 23rd, a crowd of black and white students tore down fences at the construction site, only to be driven back by police. The retreating students decided spontaneously to occupy several campus buildings. The atmosphere, as far as anything I know, was very peaceable in those occupied buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of friends of mine actually got married in their building. Andrea Egan and her husband got married. That's one of the places where women's liberation was born in those occupied buildings. And, you know, just over simple things like women saying, hey, why should we be serving, the, preparing the food? The lifestyle was communal. Drugs and liquor were banned by popular vote, but food and drink were smuggled in. And as the occupation continued, in between the talk of theory and tactics, there was a lot of playfulness. University President Grayson Kirk was not amused. Our young people, in disturbing numbers, appear to reject all form of authority, he said. I know of no time in our history when the gap between the generations has been wider or more potentially dangerous. When they took over the campus and they put feces in the, somebody's office and they're throwing people's papers out and they're getting professors, taking their life work and throwing it out on the floor, I wrote a statement for Nixon and some of the Nixon people were really opposed and I just denounced the demonstrators 100% at fault, overprivileged kids. The first thing we did when we got into Kirk's office was hit his files. Besides uh, a bunch of crap in his girly magazines, we found a bunch of papers linking Columbia to the IDA, uh, a whole bunch of shit about putting down SDS, and a lot of letters about cleaning up the area by moving out the blacks and the Puerto Ricans. After a week, the administration had had enough. They called in the police to clear out all five occupied buildings. We have been informed that the police department will take all the necessary action in connection with our complaint against you. It was class warfare a thousand blue-collar New York cops against some radical Ivy League kids. Watch it, okay, get back. Bring them into the door. Well, I, I dropped my glasses when I was running. I asked a cop officer, could I please go back? And he whacked me in the f***ing face. I was completely shocked when the police went in and beat up people so, so badly. 
Nothing prepared me for that. Nearly 150 people were injured and many were arrested. But President Kirk was forced to resign and eventually the students won most of their demands. Students were at like a revolutionary breaking point. I remember some poll that said one million college students self-described themselves as revolutionaries. It wasn't just the United States, it was international. Students in Germany, France, Japan, Ireland, China, Mexico had all taken to the streets, demanding everything. Student power, an end to the war in Vietnam, or simply more freedom. We were hearing by 1968 in this country, over and over we were hearing the analysis that we were uh, a generation of spoiled kids, that we were uh, Dr. Spock's kids, that permissive child raising, which actually I never experienced in my own life, but uh, was, the, was the source of the movement. Well, that couldn't have been true in Germany. It was not true in Italy. I mean, it was not true in Japan. You know, and the fact that it was international, I think, completely refutes that very simplistic psychological argument, which we heard all the time. Everything that happened overseas um, fueled the sense that we were on the cusp of some momentous change in the history of the world. The Columbia strike may have reminded people of the Paris Commune, but May 68 in France was the real thing. What began as a student protest for reform of the archaic authoritarian French university system sparked a general strike that electrified the country. They were anarchists, most of them. That was the spirit. The slogan was all power to the imagination, uh, that you can do anything, you know, that we don't have to live with all the various forms of repression, which we're used to. So it was anti-capitalist, but that was just part of this general, complete sort of cultural revolution that the, uh, the French students were anticipating. And so it's interesting that although they were the furthest out in any way politically, that was also the one place where workers joined with students and almost toppled the government. May 10th, the night of the barricades. 20,000 students marched in the Latin Quarter. Police and students clashed. Street fighting went on for weeks. The rioting and marches of up to half a million people frightened not only President de Gaulle, but the French Communist Party as well. The old left thought this new left was out of control, that they had impossible dreams. The two principal slogans, I think, were quotations from uh, Marx and Rimbaud. Uh, from Marx, uh, let us change the world, from Rambo, let us change life. Carlos Fuentes, the Mexican novelist, was an active participant in May 68, along with many international students caught up in the excitement. What there was was a sense of extraordinary uh, brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, there was this capacity to embrace people in the streets. Uh, there were couples kissing. There were couples that fell apart because they did not share political views. Paris was divided by the River Seine as never before. On the left bank, you had the, the left, the revolutionaries, the dreamers. On the right side, you had the conservatives, you had the Gaullists, you had the fi financiers, the money people, the bourgeoisie. So the city was divided uh, as much as in uh, Les Miserables, in Victor Hugo, or in any of the great occasions of this city that seems to need a great uh, revolutionary explosion from time to time. Eventually, the May uprising subsided. The powerful trade unions controlled by the communists refused to take part, and police kept up relentless pressure. But over time, the students did succeed in reforming and modernizing the French educational system. And they rejuvenated the Socialist Party, which a decade later became the elected government of France. It became a great, gigantic fraternal feast in which everybody was kissing everybody, embracing everybody, patting everybody on the back, and saying how happy they were and how free they felt. And this was contagious. It was marvelous, and I don't think we'll ever see it again. <laughs> 